If it were easy to make money in the stock market, everybody would be doing it. They're not rich, and you know there's a reason why. I'm telling you, the stock market has changed my life, and I've learned some really simple techniques that can help you become consistently profitable. I'm Jeff Bishop. I'm the co-founder of RagingBull.com, the world's fastest. Good morning. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. Woo! We are so excited to lift up the name of the Lord. Praise him. Give him all the glory. Amen. He is worthy of our praise this morning. Are you guys coming in with hearts overwhelmed? Everybody online also, are your hearts overwhelmed? Like I told the team this morning, you're in the right place because we're going to look to him alone because he is our rock. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Here we go. When my heart is overwhelmed. When my heart is overwhelmed, I will look to you alone. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. You will stand when others fall. You are faithful through it all. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. In the blessing, in the pain. Through it all, you never You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart. I can rely on you. I can rely on you. When I've struggled to believe. When I've struggled to believe. You have not let go of me. God, my rock. 
God my rock, God my rock. Carried through the darkest storms, you have held me in your arms. God my rock, God my rock, God my rock. In the blessing, in the blessing, in the pain. Through it all, you've never failed me. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart. I can rely on you. I can rely on you. You are the joy of my life, Lord. You are the joy of my life. You are my song in the night. There is no one as true. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. All right. Good morning. Good morning, Pastor. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. It is great to see you here worshiping as we uh, worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. If you're new and you're online, my name is Jeff Wirtz. I'm the pastor here along with Pastor Ken Sinclair, and uh, welcome to everybody. We've got a few announcements before uh, we get going, and I'm going to, Pastor Ken, I'm going to throw you this so you can have that. And uh, a couple of announcements. So one of the things as we've been going through this process here, the intentional leadership transition is it's so hard to get information today, isn't it, with the COVID and everything just crazy. So yesterday, four of us got together, Pastor Ken, myself, uh, Jesse, chairman of our board of elders, and Kyle, who's the chairman of the leadership team, and we did an informational video. And so it's going to come to you soon. It's going to be on YouTube, and we're going to email a link this week so what, you can get that and sit there and listen to it and kind of digest the entire process of how this uh, leadership transition has undergone. And so we're also going to send in the mail uh, information. It'll be a written update. So if there are some people just, you know, technology's not their thing, and that's okay. We're going to have it on uh, in snail mail as well as on technology. And so uh, please look for that so that we can keep you updated. Also, if you've missed the last two weeks' sermons, the messages, which were about Watershed 49, this is our 49th year, and there was a watershed moment in the early church, 49 AD, and God doing a, a watershed movement here at Faith Lutheran Church. Please go on to Facebook, just click on videos, and you'll be able to, to find that and to watch that. So uh, we want everybody to be, be on the same page. Then finally, the last thing is, uh, coming up the last Sunday in August is the fifth Sunday, and we're going to have a fellowship brunch. So it's going to be between the services. We're going to make it COVID safe, but it'll be a chance for everybody, hopefully, God willing, right, that we can get together, be both services together, and, and just to have some really good fellowship. So mark that on your calendar, August 30th. Now, uh, before we continue with our worship, we've got uh, Copeland Jones had a wonderful thing that God did in his life, and he's going to give a little praise report. So Copeland, come on up, and I'll let you use this. Good morning. Um, so about three weeks ago, um, I had a baseball tournament. And at the very end of that tournament, I injured my wrist pretty badly. Uh, I couldn't close, I couldn't clench a fist, I couldn't close my hand for a solid week. It made it difficult to do a lot of things. It was difficult to do my job here, doing the yard work and everything. So uh, I came to Pastor Jeff and I asked him to pray for my wrist. And instantly after the prayer, I was finally able to close my wrist again, still with some pain. But after about a week, my wrist has completely healed. And it's just incredible how fast it worked. And just praise God for that. Amen. 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 Yeah, and, and you know, there's two things, Copeland, that, that we can take out of that. One is that something like a baseball wrist is important to God, right? Mm -hmm. 
there is nothing that's too little that's important to God. And two, that we know that God still moves today just like he did in the early New Testament. So there's great power in prayer. God still heals because God is our healer. Amen? Amen? All right. With that in mind, let's uh, uh, start with our worship. So please stand up as our praise team leads us in worship. Amen. We just praise you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for this time. Father, for reminding us that you turn graves into gardens. You take things, dead bones, and you breathe life into them, Lord. Again, like I said earlier, if you're coming with a heart overwhelmed, if you're coming with a dead bones, if, you're, if you need a, a breath of life this morning, you're in the right place because the Holy Spirit is here and, and he wants to connect with you. Let's just let him as we worship and praise. Let's let him just pour out his love on us. Amen. Sing this with me. I search the world. Here we go. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, Lord. You came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. There's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid, Lord. And I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain Hallelujah. is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Hallelujah. You turn mourning to dancing, Lord. You give beauty for ashes. Hallelujah. Let's sing this out. You turn mourning to dancing. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Sing that again. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Oh, oh there's, there's nothing, nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. There's a peace I've come to know. 
Though my heart and flesh may fail. Sing it with me. There's an anchor. There's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome. And the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead. And I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings before my God. Fall on my knees and rise. day that's drawing near. There's a day that's drawing near. When this darkness breaks to light and the shadows disappear and my faith shall be my eyes. Jesus has overcome. Jesus has overcome. And the grave is overwhelmed. We have victory. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead. And I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow. No more pain. I will rise. For my God, fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. I hear the voice of many angels sing. I hear the voice of many angels sing. Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the cry. I hear the voice of many angels sing. You are worthy, Lord. Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the cry of every longing heart. Worthy is the Lamb. Sing, worthy is the Lamb. Oh, worthy is the Lamb. of all of our praise, Father. You are worthy. You are holy, holy, holy. We join the heavens. We join the angels. We join all of heaven in declaring that you are worthy to be praised. Sing with me. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Let's sing him a new song. Sing a new song.
to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. You are holy, Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Oh, with all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore. Clothed in rainbows, clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, Lord. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only one. the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore. Sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Oh, with all creation. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We adore you, Father. We bless your name. We thank you, Father, for your holy presence in this place. We thank you that you sit on the Holy of Holies and that you have rent that veil so we can enter into that holy of holies and meet you right here father father i just ask that you continue to work on our hearts and pour out your spirit on our hearts in jesus name amen amen Wow, that was wonderful worship, wasn't it? Praise the Lord. So this is what we call our honest time. We Traditionally, we call it confession and announcement of forgiveness. I call it honest time. So I get to be honest when I get up here. And by the way, I want to let you know that uh, if you get a phone call from me and I ask you to come up and be willing to do this in the future at some point in time, say yes. Because you don't have to be a pastor to announce forgiveness, right? Uh, it's been given to the whole body of Christ. So honest time this week, this is, this is not one of my proud moments. 
Um, my wife knows one of my sensitivities is customer service. And I had an encounter this week where I had to pick up a product that I had purchased and, and paid for, and it was close to closing time. And uh, the individual at the company really got on my case that I would come just a few minutes before closing time. And I was like, you're not even closed yet. And so I wasn't very happy. And I don't need to go into the details, but I was convicted by the Holy Spirit that, you know what, Jeff, that's not the way you respond. Maybe you had one of those this week. Right? That's why we call it honest time, because the great thing is, is God already knows about it, doesn't he? And that's why when we talk about confessing our sins, it's, not, it's, it's in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, by the things we've done or the things we've left undone. And not one of us was perfect this week. Maybe even this morning, right? So that's why we take a moment because God invites us, since he already knows it. He says, you know, the only one who's hurting by you holding on to this is you. Because you carry it around as a burden that I really want to take. That's what Jesus died for. Jesus didn't die for, for good, good people. He died for sinners, of which we all are. So let's take a moment. We'll just silently, you and God, nobody else around, at home, you and God, and let's just confess. Lord Jesus, I am so glad that you are 100% human as well as 100% God. That makes me feel really good because I know that you lost, uh, you, you got angry. You were always within bounds, but you understand anger. Uh, you understand the temptation that all of us go through. And to be able to pray to you and to know that that's why you came was to understand us and then to take care of our problems, boy, that just really gives encouragement to me and I know to everybody listening today. And so as we have confessed to you, Lord Jesus, that we have sinned, we've sinned against you and against other people. We've sinned in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions by the things we did and the things that we should have done but didn't do. And so we give those to you, we lay them at the cross, and it's my privilege to announce to you the grace of God, that as you have confessed your sins, you've been forgiven, you've been washed clean. Receive that and then live in that. Don't walk away with your head bowed down in shame, but walk with your chin up because you're a redeemed child of God, royalty in his eyes. And I say that and I proclaim that in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. amen. Isn't that beautiful? That's, that's the privilege of being honest with God and to receive that forgiveness. Okay, our stewardship verse today is Leviticus uh, chapter 27, verse 30. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. We give our first fruits to him, not our leftovers, right? And that can be a really challenging thing at this time of, of life with the COVID virus and everything. I encourage you to continue to do that. And for individuals who haven't yet learned to give the, the tithe, the first 10%, just choose a percentage and begin to do that and pray and ask, ask God to bless you and to open your heart. Uh, as we continue to give here, we want to thank everybody who's been giving faithfully because you have. And uh, for those who, who haven't yet learned, we can give online, which is really a, a simple way. I know some people have been mailing their checks in, but however you do it, thank you for your continued faithfulness as we trust God to provide for everything we need individually as well as corporately for the body of Christ.
So let's pray over those offerings, and then we've got some other things to pray for as well. Lord, we come to you today, and we thank you for the privilege to gather together here, in part because we can pay the bills so that the lights and the air conditioning can still be on, and that we can even uh, put online with the equipment that we have uh, this service to those who are at home. Lord, as we trust you with our tithes and our offerings, we pray that you will bless them and multiply them so that they not only bless us here locally in this church, but into our community as we reach out with the good news of Jesus Christ. We also pray that you would bless our individual families, that as we trust you, you would provide for us so that we can be generous in every situation and every opportunity. And so we pray that in Jesus' name. We also lift up to you, Lord, today, Elaine Daniel, the daughter of Erlene, who had heart surgery uh, this past week, also has a, a blood clot in her lung. We pray your continued healing. We thank you for the doctors and the nurses and uh, them being your instruments of healing. Continue that process for Elaine. We also lift up Karen Sokol, who had a knee surgery, and we ask that you will continue to heal her as that went successfully so that she can get around and be able to do the things you've entrusted her to do. Lord, we lift up all of those who struggle with the COVID virus. Lord, uh, many, many people have uh, fallen to that uh, virus, and, and many times they're in the hospitals and their families can't even come to see them. We pray your blessing, your healing upon each and every one of them, and also your comfort. You have told us, never will I leave you, and never will I forsake you. And so we pray that you indeed will allow us to sense your presence, give us your peace, and give us your strength, even when we feel alone. We pray for our governor. We pray for our mayors. We pray for the judges as they make decisions about the future direction of our state, of our city, of our, uh, of our land. We pray for the President of the United States and all of the Congress. Lord, you tell us and command us to pray for those in authority because you are the one ultimately who puts them there. May they have wisdom from on high and may they seek wisdom from on high that they may receive and bless our land. Finally, Lord, as these decisions about school have come down and uh, uh, almost all the schools will be only online to start with, we pray for the parents as they figure out and make plans so that they can continue to work and as well as care for their children. Guide them and give them wisdom as well. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. And at this time, we read our scriptures. Good morning, church. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Wonderful. It is good to be here. And I have been extremely happy that every time that I have to read, my readings are short. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know what it is. I go, Elizabeth, whatever you do, keep that schedule. <laughs> Today's reading, epistle reading, is from 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Will you please rise for the Holy Gospel from Matthews chapter 7, 1 through 5, judging others. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of a sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye? when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, 
and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is the God's, this is God's word for our reflection. Thanks be to God. May we profess our faith in the words of the Apostle Creed. I believe in God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Morning, church. I had a really good time a couple hours ago at 8 o'clock sharing a message with everybody, uh, both online and those who were here. And uh, the topic this morning is of grace and justice. I, I was really impressed last week that, and Pastor Jeff mentioned this, that during this transition time, he's heard a number of people say that what's happened here is that they've been loved into wholeness. I thought, okay, that didn't happen by accident, and it didn't happen in a moment. And this whole process of, of how we're loved into wholeness is something that God's uh, after. He, because he wants our hearts to be open to the flow of the life of God, not just to us, but then through us. Not just coming to us, but then his life moving uh, through us to other people. And so uh, one of the first messages, Pastor brought to us was about what are the walls that are torn down in our culture? Do you see those? Do you know what they are? Do you care? And then the next message, we had all those bricks in the wall. You know, how do you ask God to take those bricks out? And you can't take them out. You, we need to trust God to do that. That's something we're not able to do. And then I also brought a message about change, that shock, anger, resentment, acceptance, hope, Sarah process that we go through when things happen that we didn't expect or caught us by surprise or we don't like or, or whatever. <clears throat> and then we also talked about the seven steps of forgiveness. How do you walk through harm done to you in such a way that you're free to pray for and bless and encourage other people? And so if, if we're going to learn how to love others into wholeness, like we've been loved, then there's some things we're going to have to learn to do. And... Uh, I want you just to read this with me. Would you read this? Can we just all read this together? God is in this world, reconciling the world to, to himself. He has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, I will take him at his word, trust him with my life, and give his love away. That was in, that's been the bulletin for some 10 years now. This is what God says to us. He's in this world, reconciling the world to himself. He's given us that ministry, and so he expects us to trust him that what he says he wants to do and what he wants to do through us, he's actually capable of producing uh, his life in us in such a way that that happens. Now, when we experience being injured, that's this word wounded, and there's, there's a, uh, this unhealed woundedness Cost you a lot of energy. It just takes a lot of energy to keep all the pain and the anger and the resentment, all stuff like that, pushed down. But when there's when the Lord brings healing to our woundedness, then there's there's His capacity and a desire to bring life to other people, just like we've received it. We need to understand that that's what God calls us to. But when we experience it, it also invites us to keep on taking <clears throat> next steps with Him. And so he wants us, in, in Romans 8, 28, it says God calls us all things, including the times we're moving. God calls us all things to come together for a good purpose. Because in the end, what God's really wanting to do is shape the character of Christ in us. And when Christ in us behaves like Christ, that's transforming to uh, the things that are around us. <laughs> I believe that this is a season of the church. 
I mean, I believe that prophetically about the whole church, around the world, literally. There's things happening in our world today that are, are God's way of saying, I am shaking everything that can be shaken. I'm bringing to light the things that are going to be sorted out and separated from us. And so this is not, this is not a bad thing to happen to us. Uh, but it is a season. When Jesus said in Matthew uh, uh, 22, he said, uh, you know, somebody asked him, well, how, sum it all up. He says, well, love God with everything you are and your neighbor as yourself. Now, I know we all know those words, but the capacity and the ability and the freedom to love our neighbors as God has loved us is, is, a, is a fine dance. And so <clears throat> in that dance, we didn't know the players because one of them is the accuser of the brethren, and the other one is a comforter. This is the devil, and this is the Holy Spirit. When we recognize not just, uh, not just their voice and what they're saying, but uh, who they are and what their, each of their goals and intents and purposes is in our life, this is, this is an important junction. And if you, don't, if you don't believe this is active, then listen to the news. Listen to the conversations you have around. Listen to the world. Everybody is angry at something about somebody and whatever else it is. It's just on and on and on. And at every step of the way, it's also justified as an attitude. It's all right to criticize and correct people because after all, you did it and you're wrong and I'm right and therefore you owe me. That language we need to recognize as being authored by the accuser. The comforter is, is, is a far different uh, problem. The problem is... We have a tendency, when we recognize something is wrong, to assume without even realizing it, we know that it's wrong. Well, it is wrong, because we know it's wrong. And we also then slip over into thinking we know and can do something to fix it. And so our attitude kicks into gear that somehow we're in charge of something that we're really not in charge of at all. And so uh, th there's this tendency to, to swing away from uh, when the Holy Spirit comes into play to swing us away from accusation and criticism to, to him in such a way that the tree of life which has been planted in my heart. It's a book of Revelation. I love it where it says, in the leaves are the healing of the nations. Well, God wants to bring healing to me, my relationships, my family, my church, my city, my nation, the world. He wants to do that. And so he's planted this tree of life in my heart to accomplish that for him. So God's correction is always redemptive. When God brings correction, and he does, when God brings correction, his redemption is always corrective. Now, now, that's his intent. Does it always happen? No, not always. Jesus picked 12 and lost one. So it isn't that God isn't intent. That is his will. That is his purpose. But that we have a man has his own will as well. He can, he can also refuse that. Now, when people hurt us, Sometimes you can see a hurt to a person or a family, and you can see that just rippling down generations in the church. You can see what happens. Even though God's plan is redemptive, you can see that sometimes things go on for generations. There's a man by the name of John Arnold said, justice is good, but mercy is better. And taking the right context, I think that is probably true. But justice and mercy are both of God, are they not? Now, Think about what Micah 6, 8, you remember, recognize this verse? What does the Lord thy God require of thee but to do? Do justice. Do justice. Love mercy and walk humbly before the Lord your God. God expects justice to be done. He is just. And so when we say an eye for an eye, people say, well, that's not in play anymore. That was the Old Testament. It is still in play. God demands justice for wrong done. That is the cross event. But it's still in play. Yeah, I don't pay it because Jesus paid it for me. But this justice is still on the books. And so when we look at justice, we, what is this thing? You don't have to send a kid to school to learn that. To learn that. that ain't fair. That just comes with the wiring, right? We know that. We know that things are not fair. Nobody has to tell us that. Now, we, somebody may have to tell us that something's not fair about somebody else. But usually, if been, we've been treated unfairly, we, it's not usually a surprise to us. And so, the temptation is 
that we have x-ray vision for other people's problems and we either ignore or forget or have turned a blind eye to what we've done that's unjust. But we're, we're pretty clear about others. And it takes, as I said, a lot of energy to keep all those things down. But as we learn, as we learn to live in the mercy and the grace of God, as he forgives us for what, he, for what we have done, which is an offense to him, uh, there, there's, a, uh, it, it, there's a tendency to see injustice done and accuse it as having been wrong. And, and dear ones, when somebody says, I hate my father for doing ABC, behind this is a sense of justice that's God-authored. God is just. Does God recognize injustice? Yes. When somebody harms me and it leaves me wounded, does God recognize that that was indeed unjust? Yes. So behind the tendency, the temptation to, towards hatred or revenge or whatever it may be, behind that is something right inside of us that says, you know, that's not right. And, and, and we, need, we need to stop and, and pause and, and, and realize that that is, it, it actually is true. As we learn to bring grace into uh, situations like this, even if it's rooted in bitterness and pain, as we learn to bring the grace of God into uh, our situations, it says in James, mercy triumphs over judgment. But judgment will come. Judgment is there. But God appeals to us to be instruments of mercy, the ones who bring mercy into situations and not be trapped here or left here. And so God wants us to, to come to a place where as we go through these things, uh, God can not just he, not only heal us, but move us to a place where uh, he can say to us, son, I've forgiven you, and now I want you to be an instrument of forgiveness for other people. In my forgiveness of you, I've healed something in your soul, your spirit. I want you now to be an instrument of mine to bring healing to somebody else as well. <clears throat> the unmerciful servant of Matthew 18, 20, uh, 21 Remember the story there? The, 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 this uh, wealthy man comes and he's going to extract an uh, account for everything. He tells this guy, he says, hey, you know, you owe me. And what he owed him was an insurmountable debt. Impossible. I mean, just over the top. And he pleads, oh, have mercy on me. I'll, I'll repay you everything I owe you. That's crazy. He wouldn't have had enough time. He'd live forever to repay him back. How he spent that much money, I don't know. But the point is, when he went out, he has another brother come to him who owed him an annual salary. Now, that's, that's doable. How many of you have paid off an annual salary of debt in deadness? Yeah, some probably have still that much right now. That was doable. And the man said the same thing. Have mercy on me. I'll pay you back everything I owe you. And the guy grabbed him by the throat and refused to let him go and stuck him in debtor's prison where he couldn't work and pay it off. That's how crazy this was. And then the servants hear about it. They go to the master and say, hey, this dude was unjust. And listen to what God says to the man. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, the master turned him over to the jailer to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how your heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. When we see injustice done, that's injustice. And God says, no, if we don't forgive, it's not that God doesn't want to forgive. He does. He came to seek and to save the lost, right? But when we are unwilling, when our hearts are closed, we stop the flow of, of God's grace to us and therefore to, to uh, anybody else through us. Now, into, into this mix, uh, this, this how, how do I cry out for justice without falling short of the grace of God myself? That's the question that we're going to think through. How do I cry out for justice without getting defiled in the, in the, in the process of doing, so, of doing so myself? You remember in Hebrews 12 where he talks about uh, the Lord disciplines us in order that we might share in his holiness? Just a little bit later he says, you see to it. You see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Well, that's different than just being aware of justice and wanting it uh, rectified. I'm to see to it that the one who treated me unjustly doesn't fall short of the grace of God that's offered to him just like it was offered to me in my infractions of the law. Are you with me here? Don't lose this. Okay. Now, 
when in, in uh, 1 Peter 4, 8, love covers a multitude of sins. Now, that, that, is, that is something we can probably say to ourselves. Uh, but it, it's, not, it's not justice without mercy or mercy without justice. It's, it's, remember we talked about that Sarah, shock, anger, resentment, acceptance, hope. This is a messy place. Or the seven steps of forgiveness. How do you actually grieve over what was done and separate it so that you can actually forgive the deed and still keep fellowship with the doer, not lose, lose your relationship with them? And into this mess, this is what happens. The glory of the cross is not that God sees this messed up world down there and says, man, that sure is a mess. God's, in the incarnation is God's choice to enter into this world, to enter into everything that's separated from him and all the reasons for it and all the consequences of it. He steps into that, and that's what the cross is. It's not God being absent or distance. It's God's way of coming into this world, into all the mess and everything that's wrong with this whole world. Every, every thought, every act, every, every impulse that I've had is some way or other affected by the fall. I'm messed up. And so are all of us here and all of us online. We're, we're all messed up. And so every one of us needs this, this glory of the cross that I'm talking about here. Now, when sin is experienced, and that was by birth, it has the capacity to feel shame. And when we feel shame, when we feel shame, Adam's tendency was what? Not to come into the light but to hide, cover himself, and blame somebody else. We've talked about that a number of times. That's the inclination of sin. And when I do, there is legitimate shame that this is a prodigal son. He's out there. He didn't get it when he dishonors his dad and takes all of his share of the wealth and walks off and leaves. But out there, he's alone. He's hungry. He's mortified. He re it says he came to himself. He got it. That's legitimate shame. It exposes our depravity. It exposes the capacity we have to act as bad as what we acted, though we didn't want anybody to find it out or didn't know we were going to be doing that, whatever, it doesn't matter. Legitimate shame really does bring to light how messed up we are and how much we are in need of, of God's grace, including how we feel about ourselves. Or including what we demands we might wake above others, or where we believe life is to be found, or this one. Our strategies, the strategies that, that we come up with to deal with a world that's out of control, we can't fix it. We can't keep it under the control the way we'd like it to. And so into, into this setting, us doing all these things, is this little word trust. You know what trust is? Trust is giving to somebody else the power to determine your worth. Let me say it again. When we trust somebody, we're saying, okay, I trust you to tell me what I'm worth. Now, some people are not very trustworthy. Is God? Yes. When he sees us through his eyes of redemptive love, he wants us to know that and to trust that what he tells us is the measure of who we are, not other people around us. And so, we need this little thing called healing. God needs to, to bring something into our lives, and what he's going to bring into our lives is not perfectionism. It's not going to make you trustworthy. God's not going to fix you in such a way that now you don't mess up again. That won't happen. This side of heaven. In heaven, it will be. But this side of heaven, no, it's not going to happen. And so when he brings healing, the, this process of healing is all the way from the supernatural to the mundane. Well, it's all supernatural. From the dramatic to the mundane. From the, the road to... Uh, uh, where did Paul go? Damascus. Almost lost the word there. The road to Damascus where, you know, Paul got the deer in the headlights experience. All the way to things that you're not even sure that was God, but you kind of follow it and you find out that it was. It leads you to a place of peace and comfort. And so this process of healing is something God produces... And he always produces crippled warriors. People who have courage to stand up and minister to other people because they also have been wounded and damaged and God has brought healing to their lives. Though we're the only ones available. 
And being healed of your wound is not, does not mean you're fine, you're fine, you're not broken anymore. We're a repaired, broken vessel, useful to God, but not because we're fixed completely. It's not going to go back the way it, way, way, the way it came. I, I've heard it said that we have to deal with three things. One is uh, sadness, which is realizing that uh, things are not as they were meant to be. And then there's that word called grief, which is those are the things that you're not ever going to get back again. Something's gone. Something's changed. Something's broken. And the answer for grief is not that it's going to be returned to you. Sometimes it's just lost. And the other one is sorrow. When we begin to realize the way we've lived has left other people at risk or we've caused them harm. And as we do that, there needs to be this shift of perspective from what I need and what I, and, and we do need things. We do need to trust God to bring healing things we need, but we need to shift our perspective, shift, a shift in our perspective to where a life is found. Uh, life only, life is only, comes to us through broken vessels. That's who we've become when God heals us, and that's the way God wants to bring his healing to other people as well not through things that are made perfect, not through perfect examples, but for people who have been broken and God brought healing. And because they has, he has, then, then we're going to be okay. The problem is, uh, this little word slips in there. You know what revenge is? Re revenge is, is? Revenge is a refusal to live life. God wants to give me life. But revenge is actually living death. I want your death. <laughs> well, when I, what I, the Bible says, what you sow, you reap, right? So if I want your death, or if I want your justice, then I'm really saying, okay, that's really what I want for myself. And so revenge is really a, a turning away from life and a closing off of our soul in such, in such a way that we don't, not only do we not receive life, we don't have it to give. And so... The glory of the cross, again. The glory of the cross is, is where we're loved into wholeness. And, and, as, and as God brings healing to us, I don't need to be forgiven. I don't need to be forgiven for the times when harm was done to me. That was harm done to me. I need to forgive that person, but I don't need to be forgiven for that. But if, I, if, if in my reaction to the harm done... I turn away from the person. I turn away from the world. What I'm beginning to do is what? I'm beginning to manage my own life. I'm Lord. I'm in charge. That's not good. And so the glory of the cross says, no, I will take care of what harmed you to restore you, to bring healing, to restore your ability to trust in me again. And it's, it's going to be for a purpose because in the glory of the cross, the eternal sacrificial love of God is proven to be true. God could have stayed where he was, could have stayed separate from us. God chose to enter into this mess, and that proves the sacrificial love of God. It also proves God's wrath against sin. God is angry. Wrathful is a better word, not just angry. It's kind of emotion, kind of passing. Wrath is kind of emotion, attitude, everything. Draws a line. That's on the other side of the line. God hates injustice. We need, we need to know that. We need to recognize that and agree with it. And the son, when he was on the cross, was not passive about carrying the weight of that injustice. Remember what it says, 1 Peter 2, 23? It says, though he was reviled, he did not revile and didn't react, but he did what? This is important. He kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. I just cannot be, a, I've gotten hurt a few times, just a few times, a little bit. I cannot imagine the agony of the cross, moment by moment by moment. And as he did, he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously because he was being judged unjustly. It was unjust. And that was the cost that my sin put upon him. And he kept entrusting himself on my behalf to the one who judges righteously. In Matthew uh, 5, 43 to 48, there's this thing about, you've heard it said that love your neighbors and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, 
that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and send rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax gatherers doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that, but be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. A heart of compassion towards our enemies is modeled after Jesus' life, the tree of life that's planted in my heart. I'm going to give you a definition of love. Love is the free gift that voluntarily cancels the debt in order to free the debtor to become what he might be if he experienced the joy of restoration. Let me read it again. The free gift that voluntarily cancels the debt in order to free the debtor to become what he might be if he experienced the joy of restoration. That's a definition of love by Alan, who wrote the book, uh, The Wounded Heart. And as I was thinking through this, he, uh, he talks in his book about a woman who had been severely abused by a very uh, ugly, vicious father. And she said she'd, she'd rather die than being reconciled to him. And he offered to her two buttons. You push this one button, and the man is obliterated. He says, not one atom be connected to the other one, just completely destroyed. The other one would be, you push that button, the man is restored to what God meant him to be in the first place, the kind and faithful, gentle, safe father. Would she be willing to push that button? And she broke into tears. That's really the cry of our heart. Behind the resentment and behind the bitterness sometimes is this thing authored to God that, you know, that's not right. That's unjust. And it is. And, but when God offers us this free gift that he voluntarily cancels our debt in order to free us so that we can become what we can be when we experience the joy of restoration. That's what he's asking. He says, I've loved you. I want you to love other people as well. That's what he's saying to us. And so, re to, to reclaim the potential, to reclaim the potential good in another, even at the risk of great sacrifice or loss to myself, is a life of culty. And that is, as I said before, not an easy one. Justice for you, mercy for me. You know the word for that? Revenge. That's when I say, okay, I really want justice. I want you to pay up for what you owe me, but Lord, have mercy on me. That doesn't work. That's this thing. And that blocks the process that God invites us to. And so the redemptive desire behind the revenge is what we need to focus on. It'll be, it'll be an anchor for us. Even if you got to the point where you're just really revengeful, if you put this up here, okay, God, you're, you're stirring me a sense of injustice. You want me to pay attention? God hates justice. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice at the gates, Amos 5.15. Hate evil. It's not godly not to hate evil. Hate evil and love good. And when we do, that establishes justice. It's justice is good. Justice is of God. Can you say justice is good? The love of God is good. It's the answer for the injustice done. And so when we love others, the way I said before, to hate evil and love good establishes justice at, at the gates. There's this hunger for justice. There's also this fantasies of revenge that every one of us is going to struggle with. Now, this, this fantasy for revenge doesn't leave room for any kind of restoration. That's not our goal. Our goal is one, a pound of flesh. It also, it, it, it also uh, gets in the way of God's ability to bring about justice. Our ability to bring, establish justice is pretty puny, <laughs> really, when you look at it and think about it. And when we try to extract it, we get in the way of God's justice. And so... This hunger for justice, though, uh, God gives us the opportunity to conquer 
and overcome evil in our time. And he says it's this way. Do good. Do good. Remember the passage? Your enemy, he calls a fire upon his head. Right? You treat him kindly. You make provision for him. You help him. And God says, when you live that way, I can use that behavior towards others. You're doing good in spite of the injustice, in spite of the desire to bring revenge, when you can hunger for justice and act in a loving way. God says, I can, I can use that. And we need, we're going to need to see that this is a push until the end. This one isn't going to go away. We're going to continue to struggle with injustice. Think about it right now. I, somebody sent me a text the other day. The Supreme Court just told the churches in Utah, no, they can't gather more than 50 people at a time. Casinos can gather 50%, which could be up to 500 people. Churches can't. Is that unjust? That's unjust. That's discrimination. I know that. Why doesn't the Supreme Court know that? I could, yeah, I could get off on that one. You understand what I'm saying? There's things around us that are going to keep on showing us there's some injustice here that we're dealing with. And when we do, sometimes, by the way, when an infraction is not all that big, we really do need to learn how to grin and bear it. We need, we need, we need, at some point, you need to laugh at this broken world. Give yourself a break. Don't take everything so serious. And what I meant by that is grin and beard. I don't mean, ah, you know, grin and just tough up under it. I mean, we need to learn to smile at, at ourselves when we fail and when other people fail us. We need to grin and bear. But sometimes, sometimes the hurt is a lot deeper. And this is on the other end of the spectrum of infractions done to us. Sometimes when a wounding has been severe, we need to be ready to say to the person, you know, I'd like you to know the joy of restoration. I would, I would like that for you. And if any of you have ever been in that situation where you've been deeply wounded or deeply harmed or abused, we need to not only say this, we also, we also need uh, to know that it's going to have to include a rebuke and that we can't let ourselves fall into temptation to restore things back to normal. God's intent is to intervene and redeem. And sometimes when abuse has been very, very hard, this is the hardest thing that we could possibly imagine doing. But when we do, when we're able to say this and pray this for other people, uh, the mercy of God isn't a, a promise to us that it's going to remove and fix everything that's hurt in us. Sometimes we will carry the pain and the loss in order to be redemptive and restorative of others. There's a lot of injustices in this world that, that I'm not going to be able to address. It's not within my power, not within my arena. But we can ask for justice. We can cry out for it. And we can't not do it when we see it's happening. That's, it's the call of God in our lives to well up and do that. So I'd like to just pray for us as we, as we face this week. Lord, we are going to continue to uh, confront the things of this world around us that are not as we'd want them to be. And Lord, you want to begin with us to show us your love for us and to show us your desire to teach us to trust you, to bring healing to us in such a way that we become your instruments of healing for others. Lord, the thing you've begun, we ask that you keep it and bring it to completion. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow. That was an amazing message. And I just wanted to give quick testimony as Donnie starts the music part of it. When I chose this last hymn, I, when I always choose an ending hymn, and why don't you stand to your feet because we're going to, if you're able, we're going to 
like go out of here just praising his name. His grace is enough. I didn't know that Pastor Ken's message was on grace and justice, but the second, uh, second verse says, great is your love and justice, God. If that is the Holy Spirit. So let's sing these words out. We've learned about this, and now we'll let it soak into our heart. Amen? He is faithful. Amen. We praise you, Lord. You are faithful. Sing with me. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, God. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace. And all your people sing along. So remember, so remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise. Oh God, your grace, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Oh God, your grace, your grace is enough. Reaching down to us, your grace is enough for me. Oh God, I see your grace is enough. I am covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me. For me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All right, so in that grace, let's go out. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord give you his favor as you extend grace to others this week and his peace. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Have a great week. Amen. <clears throat>